a fitting end to a backstabbing ice queen. This episode has it all. Evil girlfriend stole car from boyfriend after his deployment, and had him beat up, but in Karen for a hero helps to get it back, bitchy thieving co-worker, blames someone else for her $3,000 mistake. Shitty roommate suffers a, shitty, way of revenge. Two stories about evil managers. One not sticking to an agreement, and another one unjustly firing an loyal employee. Both get to meet Big Boss Karma. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. So this happened around 2008. My buddy Brock had gotten out of the military after 10 years. He'd started in the Marines but transitioned into the Army for the last four years before buying a house in Texas. When he got out, he did a variety of jobs before landing a gig with a repo service. He worked there for a year and had a lot of wild stories, but this one sticks out the most as he helped a fellow soldier get revenge on an evil ex. Brock was at the office speaking with his manager, whom I'll refer to as Abby. Now this particular Abby had a lot of Karen-like qualities but was a force for good if you can believe that. While they were talking they see a young man enter the office. They immediately noticed he had two black eyes and an arm was in a sling. The young man, whose name I unfortunately never learned but I'll call Ben, asked how hard it would be for them to help repossess his car. Abby called her daughter in, Abby Jr., and had her poor Ben a cup of coffee. Abby then asked Ben to tell her the story. Ben began with telling her that he had just returned from a deployment. He had been dating a local girl before the deployment. Thanks to a previous deployment he had managed to get himself a used black Dodge Charger, which was his baby. He further explained that shortly after buying the car he had met the local girl, who for the sake of the story I'll call Morgan. Morgan was always asking to drive his car but he would always decline. When he was getting ready for his deployment, Morgan repeatedly asked if she could borrow the car but he kept saying no. After much needling he relented, but on the condition that she take care of his apartment until he comes back from rest and relaxation leave. She agreed. Ben left for his deployment while Morgan took care of his place. When Ben came back for leave he found his apartment immaculate. He pulled his car from storage, drove to Morgan's. He spent a few days with her before handing her the keys and heading to his home state to visit family before returning to his deployment. He returned again from his deployment and found nothing but trouble. When he walked into his apartment he found a layer of dust on just about every surface. It was almost like no one had been there in months. When he checked his bedroom he'd found his room had been torn apart, all of his drawers had been searched and upturned. He tried to call Morgan but never received an answer. He located his safe, which was hidden, and found it hadn't been touched. He then grabbed his spare key from the safe, called a buddy of his and they went to Morgan's. As they pulled up to Morgan's he saw a car there that he initially didn't recognize, but as they got closer he realized it was his baby. Morgan had the car painted hot pink and put 24-inch spinners on it. He tried the key just to make sure and the lights flickered as it unlocked. While his buddy laughed, Ben went to the front door and Morgan answered. He asked what happened to his car and she responded, it's my car now. Ben walked away and hopped in his hot pink mess. As he started it, four large dudes came out of Morgan's house, one with a baseball bat, and yanked Ben out of his car. They proceeded to beat the crap out of him in the driveway before his friend intervened, pulling his conceal and carry pistol on the group. He then took Ben to the hospital. I'm honestly not sure if the cops were called on this. I'd assume yes, but even then Ben said his friend drove by Morgan's house a handful of times, while he was in the hospital, and the car was never there. Abby stared at Ben for a bit before asking for the paperwork. Ben handed it to her and Abby had a smile form on her face. She then asked Ben for Morgan's phone number. Ben gave it but wasn't aware of what was about to happen. Abby handed the phone to Abby Jr. who then dialed the number. Abby Jr. then began speaking to Morgan, telling her that they'd met at one of the local clubs and wanted to know if she was down to party that night. Apparently Morgan agreed and the plan was set. Brock parked his tow truck at the club and waited. Sure enough Morgan showed up with the pink monster, parked it, and went inside with some girlfriends. 
Brock gave them five minutes before he stealthily drove up to the car and hooked it up. As he was pulling out with the pink monster Morgan walked out of the club. She saw her car in the tow truck and began trying to flag Brock down, but he was already out of there. The next day it was business as usual at the office when Morgan called. She was furious that her car was stolen by them and wanted it back. Abby, using her best customer service voice, told her if she had the registration she could come pick it up. Morgan began screaming louder that she was gonna call the cops at which point Abby sarcastically told her, please do, then hung up on her. As this phone call was going on Brock happened to look out the window and saw Morgan standing next to a car in a vacant lot, throwing what appeared to be a temper tantrum. After Abby hung up, Brock watched her get in the car on the passenger side. Abby then looked out the window and had Brock verify it was her. She then began to smirk. Abby then proceeded to call the owner of the property Morgan and her friend were occupying. She told the owner about the car and asked if he wanted it towed, the owner okayed it. Brock then drove his truck over to the ladies in the car and introduced himself. They tried to explain that they were waiting for Morgan's boyfriend, but Brock insisted they weren't allowed to park there. They argued and called him every name in the book. Brock then hooked up their car and lifted it partially off the ground, forcing the two to exit the vehicle. They tore into him until he showed them the tow order. While this back and forth was going on Ben arrived at the office and Morgan saw him walk in. She ran to the office door and Brock proceeded to lower the car. When Brock went back to the office all hell had broken loose. Morgan apparently tried to snag the keys back from Ben, but he pocketed them. She began to hit him in his hurt arm and warned Ben, that she'd call her friends to finish the job if she didn't get her keys back. Abby Jr. had already called the cops at this point and Brock got in between Ben and Morgan, even telling Morgan to try hitting him to find out what would happen. Morgan then tried to play the pity card and said she only wanted the keys to get her laptop out for school. Abby asked Ben to hand the keys over to Brock so he could grab the laptop. Brock retrieved the laptop from the car and as he was handing it over she rushed to aggressively grab it but knocked it from Brock's hands. Completely furious at this point, Morgan accused Brock of dropping the computer on purpose and threatened to sue. The cops then arrived and Morgan began her sob story again, telling the police that they stole her car. The police questioned Abby and she gave her casual smirk while asking if they wanted to see the security videos. The police watched and listened as Morgan punched Ben several times, and heard the threats she made about sending her friends after him. The police then turned to Morgan, who had turned ghost white at this point. She tried her way back to the door but the police stopped her. They proceeded to ask about the car, Ben's injuries, and who she planned on sending after him. She initially denied everything, but they already had evidence on her beating him up. She was arrested and Ben got his car back. After the cops left Ben admitted he didn't want to be seen in a car that looked like it was advertising Pepto-Bismol and planned on trading it in for a GTO. We later heard through the grapevine that the four guys who beat up Ben were arrested, Morgan had ratted them out. Brock had a few more stories but none of them were nearly as good as this one. So a new girl had just been hired, as many new people did in that job. Right away you could tell she thought she was hot shit. We're talking about the job, how many hours she had and worst of all, she wouldn't stop about all the dudes she was banging. How the money she got from them was the most important part. To put it lightly, she was a cold-hearted person, who made everyone feel bad about their insignificant lives, as she put it. Here's where things go down. In our store, all the racks were milled steel bars and hooks, so really hard to break and quite expensive. They could however be bent out of shape if enough heavy coats stay on them for long periods of time. Ms. Hot Shit here, though it would be a good idea to impress the management by putting all the coats on the same rack using the milled steel bars, instead of a circular rack that wouldn't warp. I protested of course as I'd been there longer, but she said, I get paid more than you, so do what I say. She got hired as a key holder of the gate, so she made a dollar more than I did per hour. I go along with it put the heavy winter coats up on the milled steel and go about my life. Well two weeks later the milled steel is of course warped and when management saw this they flipped. It was a cheap-minded store and any cost was bad to them. Anyways, she blames it on me and I get written up for it, 
now I refused to sign so they gave me less hours which also cut my pay. Because she lied I was now making 50% less than before and had a formal written complaint against me, to say I was ticked off wouldn't even start. So I devised a plan to get back at her. You see, the drywall on the center pillars had sustained water damage for an early melt earlier that year. Making them extremely soft. However, they provide some of the largest coverage of shelf space in the entire store, so basically a good 20% of shelf space couldn't be used. Now the kicker is, Ms. Hot Shit didn't know about this, as she came in a week after it had happened and to the naked eye you wouldn't think the pillar couldn't be used, as there was banners on it to try and hide the yellowing. I may have suggested what a waste not being able to have product on the pillars was, and how if someone could come up with a nice display, it would bring in a lot of customers due to how people could see it from the mall main floor. Her eyes lit up. I was taking a small break to a nice snowy lake cabin the next day, and the people she had working with her, were the manager or the temps who were not allowed to handle marketing and logistics. For example putting shelves slash rack up on the wall, due to their cost and the incident that got me wrote up. Now I knew she wouldn't want the managers to see it, because she wanted all the glory from it. She wanted to show to our three stores in the mall, that her store was the best while the managers weren't around. The result was that within a week, the drywall on the pillars collapsed and ruined $500 worth of product. Now she tried to shift blame on me, but I was away in the forest hundreds of miles from civilization. So no dice there and she promptly got charged with the repair, demoted to sales associate and written up for what they finally realized was not just the $500, but the one they wanted me to sign too. The repair was $2,500 plus the $500 stock that got destroyed when 40 pounds of drywall came crushing down on it. But I wasn't done yet. Our manager in our store specifically, was pretty chill and she's still a personal friend of mine, she had a group chat so we could talk off hours and keep up to date. Now as I mentioned before, she wouldn't shut up about all the men she was playing and how the only thing that mattered was the money. And boy oh boy did she use the group chat to share this. Sometimes one of these dudes would come around and take her for lunch. Let's just say when she was in the back for a little while finishing something up, that I let them see the text channel if they promised not to let her know I told them. So often they'd go on their lunch date and after one or two days, she'd be down a man. Finally this boiled over when one of them took her phone, and saw how many guys she had sexy time with for money, and messaged all of the other guys about how much of a lying cheat she was. After two months her fountain of man money dried up, and being demoted to a sales associate, resulted in her having no money to spend on all her lavish nights out or designer clothing. She eventually moved up to another store for more hours and stole money from the store, causing her to get fired. A fitting end to a backstabbing ice queen I think. I eventually left that job after half a year later to pursue my current job. This happened three years ago. So when I was 15, I was diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia. Now despite what TV shows and movie portray it. Not all schizophrenia are and serial killers. If you can keep your medication in balance you can live a perfect normal life. From the age of 15 to 20 was rather hard, as we tried to form the right balance and medication for me. But it been 11 years since I was first diagnosed and has been 6 years since I have any really bad symptoms. There has been a few minor issues when my meds would go out of balance but nothing too extreme. This happened three years ago. I had just moved into a new apartment with two new roommates. We will call them Zach and Rachel. Yes, those are their real names cause fuck them. Anyways due to my illness, I take multiple medications. A antipsychotic, antidepressants and a anti-anxiety medication, to name a few. These are all rather strong forms of medication. So when I moved in and got settled in, I started to notice some of my meds started going missing. I have my pills counted out and ready. So I know exactly how many I have. I immediately suspect my roommates, as they were the only one with access to my room. I also knew for a fact they took other medications to get high. They were pretty open about it. But I had no proof. And didn't want to risk pissing them off, as I had to live with them. So I looked past it hoping it was a one-time thing. But it wasn't. After a few days of this, I lost it and confronted them. 
They denied it and of course I had no proof. I even got a lock for my room. But somehow they still managed to get in. So here is where the revenge starts. So due to all my medication, I get constipated a lot. So I have a very stronger laxative I take when this happens. They are tiny pinkish pills. If you don't know about medication, you could easily mistake these for something else. One morning before heading to work, I took my antipsychotic pill bottles, and switch out the pills for my laxatives and left. When I came home that evening, both my roommates were in the washrooms. I asked Rachel what was wrong and she made up some bullshit food poisoning excuse. They spent the whole night in and out of the bathrooms. My medication stopped disappearing after that night. This happened years ago, my actual first job working for a pay, we got paid in cash. This is important later. Just a little background. My first job was working at a local drive-in. Yes, I'm that old. Anyway, anyone who has worked in a movie house knows how much work there is to do, for an insanely short period of time and then it just drops off. Same with a drive-in only the folks never stopped coming in and at intermission it was chaotic. When our shift started we had to make popcorn for the entrance, we sold boxes there, enough for the snack bar to use, boil the hot dogs and set up the french fries to drop and get the oil heated up for steak fingers, fries, tots, etc. so there was a lot of activity when we started. Our manager at the time was a guy around 30, whose wife managed one of the other drive-ins close by. He was a tyrant. Had us come in on Sundays to fix speakers without pay because in his words, we got paid for doing this job during the week. This drive-in was the only two-screen drive-in in town. That meant on any given night there would be two prime movies followed by a B-movie on each screen. The kind you might use for other activities. At a drive-in. Our work rotation consisted of cashier slash ticket at the gate, sometimes two pair for a new release and five to six working the snack bar. We all rotated jobs so everyone had a chance to work at the gate. Whoever was giving tickets had to wear a pair of white overalls as dealing with a lot of cars things could get messy. The ticket part of the job was to take the money from the driver, hand it to the cashier, and then give back whatever change they needed and tear the ticket and have to give them their half and put the sold half in a jar. That way the money would be equal to the ticket sales. Anyway, one night I was scheduled for the ticket job. Love that part as you'll find out. We were having a really good Friday night, about 200 cars with 3 to 4 people each. Prices were by the car load, and $5 got you in. I also sold popcorn at the gate so I had my own money bag and about 100 boxes of popcorn to sell at 50 cents a box. All well and good. We closed the gate when the opening features started, the commercials, promos for future movies, cartoon, etc. We counted up the cash, both from ticket sales and popcorn. The cashier counted her money and said, I'm a dime short. Are you sure? I asked. I counted and sure enough, she was a dime short somehow. I had made a bit extra in my count because some folks didn't want change back, so I had a few dollars more than the boxes of popcorn I sold, so I took a dime from my bag to make hers balance. We head back to the snack bar, because we still had to help get ready for intermission. Yeah. Remember I said we had 5 to 6 to work the snack bar? On weekends it was usually 5 to 6 to work both sides of the snack bar. So it was going to be real busy for most of the evening. We get back to the snack bar and immediately the manager, who has had a few, starts counting our bags. I mentioned that cashier was a dime short and I gave a dime from my bag to balance hers. I never got the chance to explain I had tip money. This is how the conversation went. You're fired. I asked him, for a dime? He said, yes, if she was short she would be fired and have to explain why. I tried to explain that I had tip money so I could balance her bag for the night. He told me tip money should have come to him to distribute, not for me to use how I feel. Then he said, you're fired. So I am sort of glad I got away from this job. During the summers when we were out repairing the speakers, it got insanely hot and we had zero shade. We got no breaks for water or bathroom or got paid fairly for the hours we put in. He never helped. In fact we rarely saw him once the movies started, 
and on Friday slash Saturday nights when we were really busy, he brought in female companions for the evening and locked himself in his office. During the week he would get drunk and pass out. Then we'd open the doors and enjoy the movie while getting ready for intermission. We'd close them right before the movie started because the tyrant wouldn't let us watch the movie, even if we had nothing to do and was always hovering around at intermission. I felt bad for his wife, I had worked a couple of weeks for her since she was short-handed and her and the tyrant were used to helping each other, so all the women that would show up on weekends were there as his personal entertainment. Anyway, I get in my car, find an empty spot and watch the rest of the movies for the night, wondering about getting another job. I could have ranted about the dime, and argued what I did was the right thing to do, but it would have fallen on deaf ears. And since the next payday was Friday, the owners would be in the main office counting cash and checking records for the 12 drive-ins in the city. I show up and knock on the door to be let in as the office is locked all the time. I explain what had happened and was there for my pay. The owner is a little upset that I did what I did with the dime, but that it wasn't worth firing me for it, and I should have explained the tip money. I said I was never given the chance to tell my side. On another subject did you know that manager was bringing in hookers on Fridays, and not paying us for working on Sundays when we repaired speakers? They didn't know about the hookers, the drinking, or the fact he had turned in time for us working, but took the cash out of our pay and pocketed it. This is Friday night. I have to go to the movie tonight. I go alone and pick a spot near the door to the snack bar. About an hour into the movie, the manager arrives with two girls, and they look like they have already started to party, and they go in. Five minutes after that a sedan and a police car drive up to the door and two men get out of the sedan. It's the owners with the police. Not five minutes after that, his wife drives up. Mad as hell. Stomps her way into the building. You could hear the screaming over the volume of the speaker for the movie. The door flies open, the hookers are literally tossed into the yard, the police come out with the manager half-dressed in cuffs, and the wife is beating him with a broom. It was a sight. I was told he was charged with embezzlement, lewd behavior in front of minors, and some other drunk and disorderly charges. His wife left him, took over managing most of the drive-ins for the owners and folks had a good time. Everyone got back pay, including me, so it all worked out. Oh yeah. Ticket sales at the gate. Since all of us who worked there were getting crapped on every day, we came up with a little scam of our own. Part of the ticket job, was to tear the tickets in half and keep one half for the office, the other for the purchase jar. Well, what we did was tear the ticket in half, give the half to the driver and then give the next guy the other half of the ticket. $5 to the cashier slash ticket duo. Do that for an evening it was an extra $50 for the night. More than we got paid for the week. We were all in on it and since we were scheduled evenly, no one complained about it or felt left out. Manager got convicted for that too. I was a delivery driver for six years at various pizza places, picking up and moving on to greener pastures whenever it suited me. Granted that only happened a couple times because I am, unfortunately, a very loyal employee. To be honest, I should have done that before this whole thing ever even happened. The store I was at was part of a nationwide franchise, and the waters had gotten choppy. All of the managers quit at once and they just couldn't seem to get one to stick around. It got so bad, that the area manager had to come in as acting GM and brought a manager from another store with him. These two are the main characters of this story. For the purpose of this story, we'll call them Jeff and Lola. Jeff was 45, and had been with the company for a long time before I started, worked himself up from the position of driver, all the way to being the one to oversee about 20 stores. He was actually married to another area manager. I got along okay with Jeff for the most part, he tried to get with me once but I refused his advances. Did I mention he was married? Lola and I got on like a house on fire, both being ladies of a similar age. She often confided things in me that she would soon bite her in the ass, figuratively. I considered myself a decent employee as far as pizza slingers go, came to work on time, did all of the dishes, got along with everyone and had the best delivery times. Because of this I usually landed all the best shifts, including opening on Saturdays. 
If you've never worked a tip job, you know that shift is the most coveted out there. Working through both the lunch and dinner rush before going home is well worth having to get up earlier. That information is relevant to the story, trust me. You see, there are always two drivers who do that shift. One comes in earlier and leaves earlier, and I was the one who got to come in just before we flipped on the open sign, and went home once dinner rush began to die down. This is also relevant. The final vital bit of info you need for context, is that my brother goes a bit wild at Christmas. His favorite thing to do, is book an entire movie theater for everyone he knows, to see a movie of his choice. This particular year was when The Last Jedi came out, and he is a Star Wars fanatic, so that was what we were going to see. Unfortunately it would be at 6 on a Saturday, at least 2 hours before I would get off. At this point Jeff and Lola had been with us for 3 months without managing to find suitable replacements, and I made an arrangement with the other opening driver to switch shifts, because his ended right when I would need to leave to make the movie. I then cleared it with Jeff and he agreed to let me go at 5.30. I was all set. Or so I thought. You see, that Saturday we started busy. Very busy. So busy that at 5.30, when I went to hand Jeff my slips, he had already dispatched me out on a double delivery. I took them, but reminded him that I needed to leave when I got back. I just hoped the trailers were long enough that I didn't miss much of the beginning of the movie. I got back from my double, and by that point it was already 6 and the theater was 20 minutes away. I had to leave. Once again I went to hand my slips to Jeff, but he got in my face. You leave when I say you can leave, he told me. You're not going to let me? I asked, incredulous that he was reneging on our deal. I came in early. I did my time. He looked so very smug. No. Well, I made a decision right then and there. There are so many pizza jobs out there that they needed me more than I needed them. I took my work clothes off, slapped that in his hand and said, fine then. I quit. It was his turn to look incredulous. After making sure I meant it, he checked me out and I left the store fuming. I missed the entire opening of my movie. But the story doesn't end there. Oh no, you remember how I said Lola would confide in me? She loved to tell me all about how often she and Jeff would meet at a hotel after work. She even horrified me by telling me Jeff would turn off the cameras, so they could have sex in the back office when the store was empty, in a chair I had sat in multiple times. His wife had been out of town for a few months, training area managers out of state. Which is probably why he got away with the affair for even that long. Lola was even so obliging to give insignificant details like the date and time this happened. So I put in an anonymous call to the franchise's HR and told them what to look for when it came to checking the tapes. I told them everything Lola had told me. But I still wasn't content with leaving it there. So I went to my local pizza place, that just happened to be in Jeff's wife's area. Remember when I said she was also an area manager? And I got to gossiping with the workers there while they made my pizza. I was well aware it would make it back to her. Food employees can't keep such juicy gossip to themselves. Jeff got demoted to store manager, then transferred to the same store in his wife's area I went to so she could keep an eye on him. I guess it didn't work out because last I heard, Jeff's wife divorced him and he no longer worked for that franchise. He would have been caught eventually anyway. His and Lola's relationship was pretty open in our store because neither of them seemed to grasp the concept of discretion. I just happened to be the one who blew the whistle. None of that would have happened if he had just let me leave on time. Thank you for watching Royal AI. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive future episodes. Share your experience in the comments, or tell us what you think of these stories.